We are back at the Daily Bread Bible Study. We are looking at Deuteronomy chapters 12 through 15 for day 56 of the Daily Bread Bible Study series. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, there's discussion about worship and idolatry, um, reminding them to thus blot out the name from their places. You shall not worship, you shall not worship the Lord your God in such ways, mainly the ways of the people of the land who have been blotted out. Um, then the first Jewish temple is foreshadowed there in Deuteronomy 12, verse 3 through 5. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all the, your tribes as his habitation to put his name there. Now I speculate the thought that even though in this promised land uh, the tabernacle would follow God's spirit around, visiting the tribes as the spirit would lead them. And as a modern reader, this text could also be used to speak about Jerusalem as the place the Lord will choose for the Israelites, or even in this new Jerusalem, our spiritual home in Christ for Christians. So Moses foresees another challenge to worship, namely the idea that distance is going to be a problem for this, as this community spreads um, into the delegated areas the, of the promised land. Now, having, having a centralized place of worship, namely Jerusalem, would make things easier. But not having that as a reality, Moses allows for sacrifice to be made outside of the tabernacle, saying in Deuteronomy 12, 20, you may eat meat whenever you have the desire. So um, people are able to make sacrifices to God, and that's a good thing to do. Um, we'll see that uh, Jerusalem becomes the central place for doing that later on. Now, when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness, they were meant to depend upon the Lord for everything, including food to eat. The Lord gave them manna and sometimes quail, and they were instructed to bring their offerings before the Lord in Leviticus 17. That passage from Leviticus thus avoids idolatry, and the sacrificing animals to false idols. Our text from Deuteronomy 12 seeks to avoid idolatry as well, yet also acknowledges distance could be an issue for the spread out tribes of the promised land. This speaks to me of our statutes um, and the ways in which our statutes should be flexible and contextual. They should be flexible to accommodate the heart of the law, which is to avoid idolatry, and contextual which allows for different applications, um, including the wandering in the wilderness versus when they are settled in their areas of the promised land. So all of this is uh, helpful structures that are based upon their day and time. And so we as Christians, and especially as the Lutheran variant of Christians, which we are always called to reform, may we continue to find ways to reform to better reflect um, the spiritual needs of people in our day and time. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, Moses then talks about success and warns them not to claim successful wonders or the work of other so-called gods. This becomes the concern for the challenges uh, that I, Elijah will face against the prophets of Baal and Mount Carmel, specifically that is 1 Kings 18. Um, though the prophets of Baal could do impressive things in their own eyes, when they desperately tried to make their so-called God show up, they were disappointed. But when called for action, the Lord, the one and only Lord, will show up just like he did in Egypt. Moses then commands you to kill anyone who invites you to practice false worship which is why the zealous Pharisees in Jesus' time have him crucified on the cross. They are following what they thought Moses commanded. Now Moses doubles down on purging ungodly ways for the chosen people, saying the Israelites should raise captured cities. In Deuteronomy 13, verse 16, burn the town and all of its spoil with fire. These are for idolatrous cities. Um, Moses worries the things uh, will be bring wrath from the Lord, so it is better to get rid of those potential issues by burning them. 
In chapter 14, Moses then restates the kosher laws given in Leviticus chapter 11. And the only thing I really notice is that the cormorant has moved positions a bit and uh, Leviticus 11, 22, verse 23 are missing. Really the blessing of locusts, the crickets, and the grasshoppers. And sorry the John, to John the Baptist who ate locusts. Those aren't really stated in this account. Moses also acknowledges other issues of distance, especially with the statutes requiring the 12 ancestral tribes to provide for the tribe of the Levites. It was easier to bring animals when the people stayed in the same camp, campsite. But now the Levites, who will work in the tabernacle, uh, would still need food even across all the areas of the promised land. Uh, Moses makes a decision as a leader and allows for donations to the Levites to be converted into other forms, namely monetary forms of money. I imagine this is part of the reason there are money changers in the second Jerusalem temple in Matthew 21, Mark 11, and John 2, and why Jesus critiques how Moses' logistical concessions became a business scheme, right? The idea was always for the tribes to be able to support the work of the priest in the temple and not for it to become a business transaction. In chapter 15, we uh, see the rest of today's uh, section. Um, and this may be one of the most radical and challenging practices to my own current context. In Deuteronomy 15 verses one through two, these radical words are said, every seventh year you shall grant a remission of debts. And this is the manner of the remission. Every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against a neighbor. So our whole system here in the United States, you know, is kind of implicated. And then in Deuteronomy 15, verse 4, there will, however, be no one in need among you. So why do I think this is radical? Well, our global world is becoming increasingly more financial with investors from all across the planet seeking to find ways to grow their wealth. We distribute and try and outsource our labor. Uh, and as such, we, the wealth is becoming more and more concentrated and less dispersed over the whole world. Now within the United States, we see interest uh, on loans for most homeowners in the form of a mortgage. And many people pay for the privilege of living in a homeowner society. Some can afford the rising cost of housings, though right now they're on a little bit of a decline, but others might fall into debt. How radical would it be if every seven years debts are forgiven? Our society and global economies would look radically different. So while I do not believe our world will return to these practices, right, it's okay to reform, but I do admire God and Moses for envisioning a society where no one would be in need among you. That is an admirable, admirable goal and hope. And the reality is that we have it pretty good here in the United States. We take a lot of things for granted and we have a lot of basic services provided for us. So the hope is that we can share what we have with others to make sure that others have dinner at their tables. Um, Moses discusses debts in the form of slavery and advocates letting a slave go in the seventh year, saying in Deuteronomy 15, verse 18, do not consider it a hardship when you send them out from you free persons, because for six years they have given you service worth the wages of hired laborers, and the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. So in short, all wealth is given from God. God will provide for us. When we have what we need, we are called to look towards the needs of others. So may we be generous as God is generous. And remember that all the land came from somewhere. It came from God. And we are not the original owners of the land that we live in. So may we remember that all land is given by God and we are just living in it um, as uh, renters for a time being.